Sing and cry, all right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and, you know, I realized this year, uh, pie, pineapple tart must be very popular, right? Uh, because uh, uh, my wife bought quite a lot of pineapple tarts and thought of uh, bringing back uh, to her office and as a gift to her colleagues. And, but what she didn't realize is that when she reached the office, she realized that everyone was exchanging pineapple tarts, you know? So... <laughs> So I got quite a lot of pineapple tart at home right now, right? Yeah, yeah. Anyway, uh, we are in a series of uh, encountering God. Uh, encountering God is is about prayer, like uh, Moses, uh, where he prayed, "Lord, show me Your face." It's a it's a deep hunger, all right, and and expectation of of us seeking for the presence of God. Uh, and it's, I believe just now at our worship, I don't know about you, I sense the presence of God in this place. Did you? How many of us, right, you encountered God earlier at the worship? I, I did, you know, I, the presence of God was so, uh, I was so real, right, at the point, you know, during our worship. And, and encountering God also means uh, having a conversation uh, with God. And therefore today, I chose uh, the book of Jonah, because I realized uh, this book is very similar uh, to the book of Habakkuk. Not Bakute, all right? Habakkuk, all right? Where he has a long dialogue between God and his prophet. Uh, like an old friend, you know, speaking casually, openly, and directly with one another. You know, sometimes encountering God can be as simple as like having a Q&A with God. And in the book of Jonah, we also see how each characters pray and encounter God through their struggles, especially Jonah and, of course, not the big fish. And my prayer for us this morning, as you are sitting here, that you may encounter God and grow deeper in Him. So may I ask all of you right now just to close your eyes and we're going to do a very quick and short prayer. Is it all right? May I ask you to close your eyes and bow your head, you know, and just Say this very quick prayer in your hearts right now. Lord, I want to know you more. Lord, I want to encounter you this morning. Amen. Amen. And so the story begins with chapter 1 verse 1 where it says, The Lord gave this message to Jonah, sons of Amittai. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh. And now is my judgment against it because I have seen how wicked its people are. But Jonah got up and went in the opposite direction to get away from the Lord. He went down to the port of Joppa where he found a ship leaving for Tashi. He bought a ticket and went on board hoping to escape from the Lord by sailing to Tashi. The name Jonah actually means duff. Some people say like pigeon, bird. And Amitai means truth. And a dove symbolizes peace and gentleness. But this is not in the case of Jonah because we saw he was in restless. He was running away from sharing the truth to the city of Nineveh. And by the way, Nineveh are people from the, you know, Assyrian. And we'll talk about that later on. And this morning, as you come into church, I'm wondering, and those who are watching online, are you running away from God like Jonah today? I don't know what are the, the, the uh, reasons, but are you running away from God like Jonah today? Have you ever felt that God is calling you to do something and, you, and, and, and something that you really did not want to do? Maybe it is something as simple as apologizing to someone. Maybe it is something that God is asking you to forgive your enemy. It is something that you know God has asked you to do, but you, it's something that you do not want to do. But can Jonah really run away from God? Is it possible for Jonah to run away from God? Jonah ran to Joppa or Jaffa in Israel today. Uh, this is a picture I took when, when I was in Israel with my wife. It's still a very beautiful place. And... And it was at this place, Jonah found a boat there. 
he paid the money and prepared to go to the city of Tashi. We don't really know where Tashi is today. I tried to do some research. There's, there's not much information about this place called Tashi. But someone said it's probably somewhere near Spain. But definitely, Jonah is running in the opposite direction of Nidavay. He thought God will stop pursuing him. He thought God will give up on him. But the Lord heard a powerful wind over the sea, causing a violent storm that threatened to break the ship apart in verse 4. And while the, while the storm was hitting the ship, all the sailors started to get panicked. And then the captain began to ask every, every one of them, please pray to your gods. Obviously, they're not praying to the God of Jonah. He's saying to pray to your gods, pray to your religion, pray to your gods for help. But interestingly, Jonah was sleeping or was found sleeping somewhere in the boat. While everybody was panicked, fear, fearful of what's happening right now, Jonah was found sleeping somewhere in the boat. And so we ask, why? Why was he so calm? That's because Jonah knew the storm was caused by his disobedience. It is like something like, you know, like Jonah is like, I expected this to happen. Why? Because I disobeyed God and God is coming after me. Probably it's to take away my life. So that was at the back of his mind. And, and, and so he knew why the storm was there. But, but he, out of his kindness, he thought that, you know, but the sailors should not be involved in what, because of his disobedience. And, and, and they should not die for his wrong. So he decided to tell them the truth. And he said to them, throw me into the sea and it will become calm again. I know that this terrible storm is all my fault. So how does God help someone who tries to run away from him to encounter him? Sometimes God gets our attention by using storms to move us out of, a com out of a, our comfort zone. And this morning as you come, church, what kind of storm are you going to today? What situation are you in today? Maybe God is trying to get your attention. Maybe God is using that as a way to say to you, stop running and come back to me. And even though after Jonah told them the truth, the sailors still tried to save him. Unfortunately, the storm was too great, was too strong, was too powerful. In the end, they have no choice that before they throw him, Jonah, into the sea, they ask God for forgiveness. And miracles happened immediately after Jonah was thrown into the sea. The storm stopped. And in verse 16 and 70, it says that the sailors were awestruck by the Lord's great power and they offered him a sacrifice and vow to serve him. And then now the Lord had arranged for a great fish to swallow Jonah and Jonah was inside the fish for three days and three nights. And also God uses Jonah's disobedience as a means of grace for the sailor. In other words, they would not have encountered God's power, God's grace, and God's love if Jonah had not tried to run away. And as I read this, this is incredible to me. This story, this section is incredible to me because it's like God using one stone to kill two birds. Isn't that amazing, right? God used one stone in one hand, he works on Jonah's calling. And on the other hand, he saved the sailor through his disobedience. Isn't that amazing? And this is also comforting to me and I'm sure to many of us this morning. Because God used imperfect people like Jonah. Especially for people like many of us who wants to serve God. Who wants to give your all to God. And yet... Because of your weaknesses, many times you want to move forward. Many times you want to give your all to God, but because of your weaknesses, you fall along the way. And then you started to feel that maybe you are not 
adequate to serve the Lord. Maybe, you know, I'm not good enough to serve the Lord. And this is a good news for many of us who are going through that. That you feel that you're not adequate to give your all to the Lord. And this is the good news to you. If God can work through someone like Joe now is imperfect, then God can work through someone like you and me this morning. No matter how messy, how imperfect we are, how unworthy and undeserving we feel about ourselves, my friends, in God, we are never beyond redemption. We are never beyond grace in Christ. God can use our sinful nature self and to accomplish His supernatural mission. And this is His amazing grace. Amen? Let's give a lot of clap offering for that, all right? Indeed, all right? Indeed, this is His amazing grace. And I also wonder, have you met someone who, you know, Chinese, they say, 十里桃生, you know, understand? Those who are Chinese understand Chinese, 十里桃生, all right? That means someone who just escaped from death before. You know what I'm to say? Someone thought they are going to die, you know, but then they were given a second chance. Have you met someone like that before? Have you encountered someone like that before? What do you learn from them? And that's the one thing I learned from those people who, who escaped from death and was given a second chance who surely thousand. I realized those people who came from that, that situation, they tend to be more grateful and they, and they learn to appreciate life better and also others towards them. Do you realize that? People were given a second chance. They tend to appreciate their life better and treat others better. And so, my friends, not all storms they are going through are always bad. You know, sometimes it's so natural for us that when we are in the storm, the first thought is that God is against me. When we're in the storm, the first thing is that this is bad for me. The outcome must be bad for me. I want to say to us, not every storm is bad. You know, God can use the storm in your life to teach some precious lessons for our spiritual growth. And God did the same for Jonah. While Jonah was drowning into the sea, almost going to die, he thought that this is the, the end of my life. Because he was drowning. But he never thought that God would prepare a fish, a large fish, to swallow him. So at the, at the point when he thought that I'm going to die, but God sent a fish to save his life. Now, we do not know what that fish is, all right? Some say it's the whale, you know, some say it's... I, I do not know, all right? Nobody really knows what that big fish is, but it must be big enough to swallow him and then to make him, make him stay in the stomachs for three days and three nights. But what did Jonas do when he was in the fish stomach? Knowing nowhere to run, smelly, in the dark, what will you think he would do? He prayed. I think he made a very smart decision. So when he was in the fish stomach and there's no way out, he began to pray. And then, you know, and then in chapter 2, verse 10, after he prayed, then the Lord ordered the fish to spit Jonah out onto the beach. So how do we encounter God when you are in the fish stomach today? How do we encounter God when we are in the fish stomach where it's dark, there's no way out, it's smelly, you are in any situation, you are like reaching a dead end and there's no way for you to run out of your situation. How do we encounter God when we are in fish stomach? Jonah prayed. And this is how he prayed. In chapter 2, verse 2, he prayed, I cry out to the Lord, in my great trouble, and he answered me. I called to you from the land of the dead, and, the, and Lord, you heard me. So he remembered God is a God who is near. And then in chapter 2, verse 7, he prayed, As my life was slipping away, I remembered the Lord, and my earnest prayer went out to you in your holy temple. He remembers God is a God who restores. And then in chapter in verse 9, 
He prayed again, but I will offer sacrifices to you with songs of praise and I will fulfill all my vows for my salvation comes from the Lord alone. He remember God is a God of hope. So when in you are fish stomach, when you, will, you know, and when we pray, and this is how Jonah prayed. He prayed first by remember who God is. Turn to your neighbor and say, remember. All right. The key is remember. And remember what in our prayer? Remember who God is. Remember who God is. Remember, even if you are in the fish stomach alone, Jesus is close to you and He's able and He wants to help you. Remember, God is for us, not against us. Remember, in all these things, we are more than conqueror to Him who loves us. Remember who God is. And I'm sure I'm not the only one standing here this morning. I'm sure many of us, you are here this morning. You have gone through the experience in your life as well. You are here today because at some point of your life, you were like, you were like Jonah. You were in the fish stomach and then you pray and then you cry and then the Lord came and rescues you. And you are here today because you have experienced in your own life and how God rescues you. So I'm trying to say to you this morning, if you are in the fish stomach this morning, remember. Remember how God saved you in the past. God will continue to save you present and in your future. Amen. Amen for that. Remember, right? God has not given up on you yet. So remember. And so after the prayer, all right, the fish vomited Jonah out into the land, onto the land. And then he said to Jonah again, Jonah, would you bring the message to Nineveh and tell them to stop doing all the evil things? And this time, Jonah obeyed. And he began to walk towards Nineveh. We don't know how long. And we also do not know how many days he spent around the city. But we know that he prayed, also he preached the message to the people in Nineveh to preach and to warn the people about God's judgment, to tell them to stop doing their wrong, to tell them to repent. And somehow, this message went up to the king. And then when the king heard the message, in John chapter 3, then the king and his noble sent this decree throughout the city. And then he said to all of them, No one, not even the animals from your hands or from your herds and flocks, may eat or drink anything at all. People and animals alike must wear garments of mourning. When I read this part, you know, I, people wear the garments. I've seen it before, but I've not seen, you know, animals put on garments or, right, the morning. I've not. Have you seen anyone? All right, but it's very interesting, all right. Somehow the king said that, you know, make sure your animal also put on their garments. You know, when I read this, I just sent a text to my wife earlier. Maybe we should dress up my two dogs, uh, you know, for Chinese New Year. <laughs> I wonder how they will be looking like, right? Uh, anyway, all right, and then he said to them, everyone must pray earnestly to God. They must turn from their evil ways and stop all violence. And then in verse 10, when God saw what they had done and how they had put a stop to their evil ways, He changed His mind and did not carry out the destructions He had threatened. Now, we obviously, we know that the people in Nineveh, they are not a believer. All right, they are not a believer. And so maybe some of us or those who are watching online, you are not a Christian yet. You're not a Christian today. And you might ask, you know, Pastor, can I encounter God if I'm not a believer today? Will God listen to my prayer if I'm a sinner today? The answer is yes. The answer is yes. God will hear your prayer and God will respond. And in fact, many of us who are in church today, we were sinners before. Isn't that true? We lie, we cheated, and we said things that we should not say. But when we needed God's help, we called for salvation and called upon the name of Jesus. Jesus did not hesitate to come and save us. And that's why we are here today. 
There's an interesting testimony, all right, that I heard from a pastor from another church uh, many, many years ago. And I still remember because this story is really unusual. So when I, when I heard this story the first time, my jaw almost dropped. But you know, God can do anything, right? And so when I first heard the story, I said, you know, it's too funny. But it happens, all right, it happens. And so my this friend, who is a pastor now in uh, serving at another church, and many years ago, he was sharing with me about how he encountered God and before he became a Christian and served in the church. So he shared with me that, you know, one day, his friend, a Christian friend, invited him to join him for their church camp. Now, in his heart, he very much wanted to go. But Bolui, you know, he said, no money, all right? So, and then, because of faith, he didn't want to let his friend know that it is because he has no money, so he, he, you know, he, he cannot accept the invitation. So the friend tried, but he said, no, la, no, la, you know, I'm not free. But actually, the, the reason is that because he has no money. But in his heart, he really wants to go. And so he prayed. And he prayed this. He said, God, if you let me strike 40 this weekend, I will go for the camp. <laughs> I'm serious. And he really strike 40. <laughs> He went straight for the and okay, please. Uh, I'm not suggesting to you, all right. Uh, after that, go and pray, you know, and God give you four Ds. Uh. But this is a true story, all right. And so he went for the camp, and, and during the camp, he gave his life to the Lord, and then he went full time and uh, uh, served in the church. Of course, uh, he has not since then, he has never gone back to gambling anymore. I always remember also my aunt who worked in uh, Geylang uh, area in a brothel serving the prostitute. And it, it, those days, would, she would come and see me all right, for two reasons. One is to borrow money. Then second is to pray for his son. And remember there was once that something happened to his son that it was so bad because her, 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 I mean her son, all right? her son was in drugs. It was in so uh, bad that she went, he went to Iman H. It was so severe that, that at that point, I saw her pray desperately, right, crying to the Lord to help her. Remember, she was not a believer yet. And so she prayed desperately and said, God, she said, God, help my son. And today, my aunt quit her job in Brotto and her son is doing well in a halfway house with the support from her church members today. Let's give a lot of credit for him for that, right? You know, God is amazing, right? You know, sometimes we cannot understand how God works. But, you know, sometimes we just have to leave it to Him. God can do amazing work. My friends, you know, if I'm not a believer today, no matter what situation you are in, I want to encourage you, pray and talk to God about anything. I want you to know that He's listening and He wants to meet you but, don't, but just uh, don't ask for a 4D number or toto, all right? Now, my parents, they are not a believer. Uh, praise God, they are getting closer and closer, but they are still not a believer yet. And so, you know, I had this very interesting conversation with my dad. And because of his Taoist background, all right, those who are in Taoist religion, because of his Taoist background, he always see me all right, as a pastor, like a saikong, you know. Yeah, you know, it's a Taoist priest. Say, say, you know, I'm like, say, oh, if not like a monk in the temple, right? You know, you all should go mountain and pray, right? Uh, become a vegetarian. But you say, this pastor is like, eat anything, you know, like, uh, like more, not like the, 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 the monk that is his pressure, more solemn, you know, reverend, right? So we, we always have this long debate, la, but after a while, I also give up, la. Gong Bei Tian Wan, you know? Yeah, yeah, cannot speak true. La. So I said, okay, la, okay, la, whatever you think about me. La. But there's one thing that's very interesting, all right? That he, he, he also says that, you know, but your God uh, bless you. La. Yeah, your God is different. Your God bless you. And your God favor you. You know why? Because um, a few times, all right, he bought my car plate number and got first prize. <laughs> And it is true, okay? Yeah, and it is true, all right? All right. So your God must have favored you, you know, and you must be very blessed, all right? Yeah. Anyway, let's go back to Jonah, all right? Let's go back to Jonah. Now, in normal circumstances, when you see a non-believer turn to Christ, now our first reaction is we rejoice with the person. 
We celebrate, right? When we see someone come to know the Lord or repent, we rejoice with that person. So, right now, Nineveh was experienced like a spiritual revival because the people are repenting, they are crying to the Lord, they were seeking for forgiveness. And you have thoughts that, you know, a man like Jonah, who is a prophet, who is faithful, I must be very happy, all right, to see the outcome on how the people had turned to the Lord. Instead, in chapter 4, verse 1 and 3, this change of plans greatly upset Jonah. And he became very angry, so he complained to the Lord about it. Didn't I say before I left home that you would do this, Lord? And that is why I ran away to Tashi. I knew that you are a merciful and compassionate God, slow to get angry and filled with unfeeling love. You are eager to turn back from destroying people. Just kill me now. Lord, I'd rather be dead lah than alive if what I predicted will not happen. And then he went out to the east side of the city and made a shelter to sit under there all right, as he waited to see what would happen to the city. Still not willing to let go. Still expecting God will do something to these very evil people or wicked people. But the Lord explained to Jonah in verse 10 and 11, He says to him, You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in the night and perished in the night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also much cattle. So, in the beginning in verse 1, the story tells us that how unwilling, all right, Jonah uh, uh, responds to God when God asks him to go to Nineveh. And, and he disobeyed God. In fact, he ran to another direction. And then after encountered the storm, and this time when God said to Jonah, go and preach the gospel to the Nineveh, and this time Jonah obeyed. And then now we see Jonah is unhappy again. And he was so upset with the change of plan uh, because they repented and God had forgiven them. He said to the Lord, Lord, let me die. Why? You know, I, I was thinking, why does Jonah have such a strong reaction? You know, what was going on? Why Jonah felt that way? So some preachers say, you know, Jonah was afraid to go to Nineveh because, uh, you know, the Assyrians or the people in Nineveh, uh, they were extremely cruel people. Uh, they are very wicked people. You know, they, they would skin their enemies alive and hung their skins on their city walls for display. Or they would kill them by using the stick with a sharp edges and poke through their bedside till they die. And so they are really, really evil and wicked people. And some scholars believe that the Assyrians had murdered his five brothers. So he wants the re revenge. You know, these people not deserve to be saved. But I believe, I believe Jonah was not a coward. I believe Jonah was a righteous man. But he was blinded by his flaw and anger just like one of us. Now, how do we know? If you go to 2 Kings chapter 14, verse 23 and 25, and you will see and understand happen why Jonah react that way. Because something happened before this event. So in chapter uh, in 2 Kings chapter 14, 22 to 25 says that Jeroboam too did what was evil in the Lord's sight. He refused to turn from the sins that Jeroboam, the first king, son of Nebat, had led Israel to commit. And then you read again. But Jeroboam too recovered the territories of Israel between Lebo Hamath and the Dead Sea, just as the Lord, the God of Israel, had promised to Jonah, son of Amittai, the prophet from Gath Hefer. So what was going on? What was going on? Jeroboam too did what was evil in the sight of God. And Jonah saw all this thing. He has seen how the king oppressed the people. 
He has seen how the king continued to support the cow worship in Dan and Beta and set up by his forefather. And instead of encouraging the people back to Jerusalem where the real temple is, you know, Jeroboam didn't do any of this but continued to deceive the people and make the people to continue the false god in Dan and Beta. So Jonah saw all the evil things uh, King Jeroboam had done. Now if you are Jonah today, if you see King Jeroboam, who is so evil in your heart, what is your first reaction? He ought to be punished. He ought to be judged. And so instead of judging him or jo- for no- Jonah, you know, expecting God to judge him, instead God asked Jonah to prophesy and bless this king because God is going to restore the boundaries of Israel through him and will restore Israel land back to its former limits. So can you see the frustration in Jonah now? God, this man, he has done all the evil. The right message to him is judgment. But now you ask me to preach blessing. You ask me to prophesy and to bless this man. You know, it was really tough for a prophet like Jonah. What is going on? And of course, we know God did not approve Jeroboam's deeds. Uh, deeds. His, God didn't approve his action. God did it out of his mercy and compassion towards his people. And so, when God asked Jonah to go to Nineveh, in his opinion, you know, Lord, this message to Nineveh should be heard by Jeroboam first. Instead of the people there, this message, because your people are suffering right now and this king continued to do evil, this message of judgment should go to King Jeroboam. But the Lord said, you go to Nineveh and preach to the people. And in the eyes of Jonah, he felt, it is not right, Lord, to save my enemy first instead of my own people. Because Assyrians was the enemy of Israel. And so in Jonah's opinion, God, your people should come first and not your enemy. So could it be that Jonah was still angry with God when God asked him to bring the message to Nineveh? Because God to refuse to let him pronounce his judgment to Jeroboam. Is it possible that he was already running away from God when God called him because he was still upset with God's decision that Jeroboam must be punished for his sin. And then when he saw God did the same thing for Nineveh, instead of punishing the people for their wrong, they deserve to be punished because you must remember he has seen all these things in Jeroboam and when he was preaching at Nineveh in and out every day, he also see how wicked the people are. He also see how they treat one another. He said these people are wicked people. So in the back, in the view of, of Jonah, these people ought to be punished. Instead, again, of God punishing their sin, God show mercy when they ask for forgiveness. And this triggered Jonah again. And this time, he got so depressed, he said, God, not again. He so got upset and got so depressed, he said, God, let me die. But God is really patient with him. God was not angry with him. God was patient with him and he tried to explain to Jonah that if he showed pity to the, to the plant, which is valueless, how much should God show mercy towards the 120,000 men, women and children who are created in his image? So what is the lesson that God was trying to help Jonah to learn? that Jonah has compassion for his own people, 
but he lacked mercy for his enemy. And another lesson for Jonah is that he called the anger of God towards unjust and wickedness. And this is good, but he was blinded by his own self-righteousness. And because he was blinded by his own self-righteousness, he missed the mercy and the big plan of God. The day will come, God will bring everything into judgment. But for now, his primary role is to save as many as possible till Christ return. For Jesus says in John 3, 17, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. So if there's one thing this morning that can hinder us from encountering God, it will be our anger. It will be our anger. Especially, especially when we don't understand His plan. It will be the anger because the anger, you know, will cause us to turn our face away from the Lord. Like Jonah. When we don't understand God's plan, when we don't understand His doing, when we don't understand that His way is different from our ways, and we got angry and we turn our face away from the Lord. So if there's one thing that will stop you from encountering God this morning, it's your anger. And not just your anger towards God, even your anger towards one another. When you feel the person deserves to be punished, but God somehow showed mercy, and you couldn't take it, and the anger will cause you to turn your face away from the Lord. The Apostle Paul says, In your anger, do not sin. Now, he's not saying to you this morning that angry is wrong. Having an anger, he's not saying. But Paul is saying to us, we need to discern carefully. We need to manage our anger because there's a difference between the anger of God and the anger of man. God's anger is holy and always justified. But our anger sometimes is mixed with our self-righteousness. And so if our anger doesn't manage properly, isn't that true? It's so easy to hurt one another with our action and with our words. Isn't that true that many times the reason we hurt one another is because we lose control of our anger. Are you still holding your anger towards someone today? Are you angry with God today? I want us to know, even though God knows that you are angry with Him, even though God knows you are still angry with someone, God is not holding against you. Because He wants you to be set free this morning. Pray and ask God to help you to heal your pain this morning. You know, in closing, this story is more than just about Jonah running away because I read quite a lot. It talks about, you know, Jonah tends to pre project Jonah as a rebellious prophet, all right? Not a good example to learn, you know. We mustn't learn from Jonah, run away from God. The story is more than just about Jonah's running away. Or neither is about the sailor, it's about salvations, you know, and uh, uh, God saved them through the storms. Or, or it's about how you pray for repentance. How you pray in a manner, you know, God will forgive your sin. And of course, not the big fish, all right? All the children, I'm sorry, I'm going to disappoint you. The story of Jonah is about who God is. It's about who God is, that God is compassionate and merciful. God is compassionate and merciful. It is about how God takes the initiative to reach, to reach out to Jonah. It's about God pursuing Jonah when Jonah was trying to run away from God. Even when Jonah was trying to run away to the other side of the island, God continued to pursue him and make sure that he comes back to him. The sailor, obviously, they did not know, they did not know God because they were praying to other gods. 
Yet God created a storm so that they might call His name for help. And God saved them unconditionally. And obviously, the people in Nineveh, they were wicked. They did all the evil things. You can imagine all the wrong things. And obviously, they do not know God. If God never sent Jonah to them, they don't even know God. They won't even care. And yet, God sent Jonah to them. Bring the message and giving them a chance to repent and experience His mercy. Why? You see, the difference between Jonah and Jesus is Jonah did not cry over the city. Jonah prayed. Jonah preached. Jonah walked. But he did not cry for the people in the city. But Jesus did. Jesus poured His heart to you. He came into our world in human form and died for you on the cross so that you and me may experience and know God today and encounter Him. We were dead, but in Christ, we were alive. Do we know God then? We do not know God. We were in our own lives doing our own things. We were doing things as pleasing in our own sight. We do not know God. But God sent His Son to us. That's why Paul said, while we are still sinners, God sends His Son, Jesus. And the Apostle Paul says, He even let His own Son suffer for us. He gave His Son for all of us. So now with Jesus, he will surely give us all things, including His presence. What is holding us back from God today? That God has done all He can to reach out to you and to me. And today, all He needs from us is to follow the example of Jonah, the sailor, and the people in Nineveh. Call upon the name of Jesus. Ask with a broken spirit and a contrite heart. Seek and you will find Him. Knock and He will run towards you. Why? Because God is already standing here waiting for you. And so this morning, if there's anyone needs healing today, pray. If anyone here this morning, you need a breakthrough, whether it's your spiritual walk with the Lord, whether it's your relationship with one another, pray. Anyone here because of financial crisis? pray. Anyone here because you are hurt by someone else and you do not know how to forgive, the anger has taken over your life, pray. What are your needs today? You need peace? You need rest? Pray. May you stand with me? I want you to pray. And I want us to pray as I, you know, as we prepare our hearts for the response songs. Why? You know, many times when we come for service, we, at the back of our mind, for some of us, it's about we are preparing, all right? We prepare, we do all we can, and then the presence of God comes. You know, but the truth is this even before you step into this hall, even before you open your mouth and praise Him, even before the worship team prepare all the music for us, even before you sit down, even before you step into this auditorium, Jesus is already here 
waiting for you. Jesus is already here waiting for all of you because He loves you. He desires to be with you and He wants to be with you. And so He will come here ahead of every one of us to welcome us. Even you come, walk into the hall with all your past mistakes, your sin, maybe it's something that you struggled for very long, maybe it's something you just struggled yesterday, maybe it's something that you just happened outside. When you walk into this hall, do you know that God can see every one of us when you step into this hall? That all the things that you have done, all the things that you have said, do you know that when Jesus stands here, He could see every one of us? No one can escape from His sight. He knows He can see all of us, our weaknesses, our past that bring along with us. But He did not come here to condemn any one of you. He came to set us free. He did not come to judge us. He came to give us new life. Amen. And that is why as we talk a lot about encountering God, we want to encounter God. I want us to know, you know, before you can even talk about encountering God, you need to understand God is the one who is pursuing after you. He is the one who has been waiting for you because He wants, to, he wants you to encounter Him. All He needs this morning is a yes from you. Would you say yes to Jesus this morning? Lord, I want more of you. Would you say that to Jesus this morning? Can you close your eyes right now as we as, uh, you know, prepare the songs? Let's close our eyes. Let's, yeah. Leads me to repentance. Your goodness draws me to your side. Your mercy calls me to be like you. Your favor is my delight. Right, Lord. Let's cry out to the Lord, shall we? Oh, hallelujah, Lord. Would you cry out to the Lord? The Lord loves you. The Lord is here. Praise you, O oh God. You know, let's give a lot of clap offering, shall we? Let's thank God for His goodness. Let's thank God for His love. 
Let's thank God for His grace. Let's thank God for all He has done for us. You know, before we leave this place, you know, God is for you. He's not against you. God wants you to know Him. And He's always ahead of you. You can all say, God is always ahead of you waiting for you to respond. And all you need is call upon His name. And you realize that God is so much closer to you than you know. And it's because of this reason we sing, God, you are good. God, you are good. So I want you to know, my friends, you are loved by Jesus. Turn to your neighbor and say, you are loved by Jesus, all right? Yeah? You are loved by Jesus. Amen, amen. Let's give our Lord one more clap offering, all right? Hallelujah. 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 Let me say a blessing for all of us before we go. May the grace of Lord Jesus Christ and uh, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all and evermore. Hallelujah. All right. Praise the Lord and Happy New Year. Sing and quiet to all of you. See you next week.